Um, who are the community health promoters and how effective are they in the community? Thank you very much, Dr. Bethan, for that question. Community health promoters are volunteers from the community. They, they are the essential link between the community and health services. The World Health Organization recommends them as being important to improve preventive, promotive, and curative health services, and especially in Africa, where there are high rates of morbidity and mortality and lack of essential health services. The Spotlight Africa Uganda Foundation Community Health Promoters are trained for nine months. Thus empowered, they act as role models and trusted members of the community who speak with their neighbors about health issues like malaria prevention. Their actions led to the eradication of cholera in the region, and they also improved health-seeking behavior to include attendance to antenatal clinics and more recently for delivery in a safe place thank you christine what challenges have you and the community health promoter team faced in encouraging the community to seek antenatal care and to deliver at the health center Yes, thank you very much. Uh, some of the, the challenges include um, mothers do not want to deliver at the health facility because they feel their placenta is more valuable. So they don't want it to be thrown either the placenta pit or they would prefer going with it home. And then secondly, they also would prefer Squatting while delivering, other than lying down in a lithotome position. And then thirdly, others also think that their mothers-in-law should be able to receive their babies other than any other person. That's interesting. And are they happy to come to the antenatal clinic whilst they're pregnant? Yes, they do, because we have uh, CHPs in the community whom we have already sensitized to refer them to the health facility. And therefore, they are doing their work. They are sensitizing them. We've had community health promoters for 10 years now. What were the challenges they had in the first place in getting women to come to seek antenatal care? Uh, one of the challenges they had was uh, in our communities, we, had, we have what we call traditional birth attendants. And therefore, before that, they used to visit the traditional birth attendants. But when Spotlight came in, it enlightened them, gave them knowledge and skill for them to, to refer mothers to the health facility that we already have in Bukasacha. Do you enjoy being a community health promoter in the Bukisakia community? Yes, I do, absolutely. Because Portland has brought so many good things in our community, especially the health facility. Before then, we didn't have. And now that we have a health facility in our community, we feel our mothers are safe because they receive all the basic health care needs that they require. As part of the UK Aid project, you have led the community health promoters to engage with men on the maternal health issues. How has this been received? Uh, the reason why we are emphasizing and training CHPs to engage men and bringing men on board on issues of maternal and child health related issues, uh, that we found that uh, men view 
attending ANC as a wastage of time. So we, we are now preaching the CHPs to reduce that gap and bridge that knowledge gap so that they will be able to sensitize the men, the benefits of supporting mothers to attend all uh, ANC services. Uh, we also see some men shy off from going for ANC services because of poverty and income levels at the household level. So we really want to encourage CFPs to motivate all the men to be uh, joining the supportive groups like saving groups so that they will be able to uh, have their income which will meet the basic needs of their health. And we are encouraging CHPs to engage men to allocate some money aside that uh, uh, are meant to support the nutrition part of the women so that they don't uh, reach to other complica complicated conditions like anemia and malnutrition. So we really support them through that right of CHP sensitization. As a clinician, I believe and appreciate the efforts given in by the VHTs or the community health promoters. The community health promoters have been trained and empowered with the skills on follow-up, counseling, and also referral. The community health promoters as well have been able to refer mothers for antenatal. Actually, our antenatal is as high as the, in a month, we are able to see over 300 mothers for antenatal, and this is the health center three. And uh, at the same time, we realized that these very community health promoters are also used as a link between us and the community. They are always at the facility to follow up for immunization, family planning, side effects, uh, the nutrition counseling, and then also they are able to tell us who delivered in the community, and then we are able to follow up on those mothers and our babies so that we can have better health for them. These very chips have been so instrumental in the uptake of family planning at the health facility. Uh, the number of family planning users has also increased. They were really, the community promoters were empowered with uh, knowledge and skills in basic counseling and they are able to offer this to mothers to allay their anxiety and you know this being community people people trust them and they believe in them so when we give them the information and they tell the people what they have and the true information we realize that the results are becoming better and we are going to reduce the maternal mortality the infant mortality because of unwanted pregnancies or accidental pregnancies that come with their own complications. Still, these health, uh, health community health promoters still are able to really do the nutrition counseling as well because you know maternal child health and nutrition work hand in hand. To avoid any abnormalities, mothers have to be cared for, they have to eat well so that the nutrients that are there are enough to support the mother and the baby. And these people are able to teach them how to use our locally available foods so that we have a better diet and good nutrition. And at the facility, we always, when they refer them, we also give them folic acid, uh, iron, and also give them the IPT for malaria so that mothers don't get episodes of malaria, they don't have the deficiencies by giving them the nutritional supplements. And these community health promoters as well have tried to bring on board the males as well, like we realize that most of the antenatals that are coming, a partner is able to escort the mother, the partner is able to escort the mother in immunization, and also during delivery, they are there. 
And this is because they have been empowered with the skills and the knowledge and they know they, they have appreciated the importance of uh, escorting a, a mother to the facility so that you get the information together and these mothers are supported. And also educate on prevention of malaria in the communities, uh, by use of a mosquito net, cleaning of the environment, so that the episodes of malaria in pregnancies are reduced and we have a very live baby and a very live mother, even even when she has given birth. I think that's what we've been doing, and as Lukasacha, we are really proud of them, and we pray that we continue working hand in hand, and kindly, this is our best, and we really love to appreciate it. I remain yours, Justine, for clinician, Lukasacha Health Center 3. Betty, um, you're a hard-working midwife, Please describe your working week and the environment that you work in. Uh, I work seven days a week. Uh, God willing, if mothers come, I deliver five children a day. And if it is better than that, I can go six, seven children a week. Like, the pre like this past week, I've had six babies. Since I started working at night, mothers come. They no longer come and find that there is nobody in the place. So we are hoping they will come more and more. And uh, I'm also training a midwife who is going to help me. And she has, she has started helping me. So we are working hand in hand with her. And uh, maybe to complain, I can say it is a complaint. I have a little room, there is a small space, so for example, I can get like three mothers delivering at the same time. Like the previous month, I had three mothers pushing at the same time, and we have one active bed, so I had to put one mother on the active bed, then one mother on the antenatal examination bed. Then the other one, I made her move around since she was like 8 centimeters. But I was not settled being a mother who has ever pushed. I was worried anytime anything could happen, but God helped. Both all of them progressed well. The two pushed and then this other one also pushed. So there is a challenge with our delivery beds. We have only one. So our privacy is not very good. So I will be the happiest if these things are given. Thank you very much. This is what I had for you for today. Thank you for joining us, Stella. Please can you tell us how you are working on engaging with the traditional birth attendants? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, birth attendant, traditional birth attendants, uh, a very key sector of um, of people when it comes to mat maternal health in the district of Mbale and I think countrywide. So we have thought that if we are to improve maternal health, then we need to bring on board the traditional birth attendants. How do you do this? We are not going to do this like looking for faults that they are responsible for the mothers dying they are responsible for mothers who come very late to, to the facilities to attend antenatal services. But we want to have a community dialogue with them. One of the health facilities within the district um, had a maternal death. This maternal death came from, was delayed from a traditional birth attendant. By the time she reached the facility, it was too late to save her life. So during the maternal death review, it was to work backward to see where the problem was, what caused the delay, and it was discovered that actually this mother was delayed at a TBS home. So the, the facility followed it up, up to the community, had a community dialogue, and um, sat with the community uh, opinion leaders, and they agreed with the traditional birth attendants to, to become referral agents. And significantly, this increased the deliveries for that facility. 
and this tickled my mind. I said, if it has happened in one of the facilities around, can't we apply it and see if it can work out? So that's why we want this strategy of converting this approach of converting the TBS into the TIBRA, that is traditional birth referral agents. Okay. So um, we are thinking that if we bring them on board, they will be our agents in the community. They are the one who's to know there is a pregnant mother who needs to attend antenatal. They will know there is a mother who is to deliver and will be uh, referred to the hospital. But you know, this has been source of their income. So you can't tell me, hand over what you have and you leave me without anything. How do I survive in my own village? So we have been thinking that if we could have smaller incentive after we have oriented the TBS, now the TIBRA, we shall change the, the title to TIBRA, that is traditional birth referral agents. Um, maybe we have a smaller incentive for them that for every mother that is referred from you, there is a small incentive tagged to that mother. And we want to work with them in such a way that they have the contacts of the midwives at their health facilities. That in every parish where there is a Tibra, I'm now baptizing them Tibra, no longer Tibi. That in every parish where there is a Tibra, there is a contact. That she has the contact of the midwives, of the uh, motorbike uh, ambulance, such that in case of anything, she just makes a call and then either the midwife organizes or the ambulance goes to pick this mother to the facility, especially those who are in labor. I am Dr. John Baptist Wanyai Nambohe. I'm the commissioner for emergency medical services. Uh, the emergency medical services at the Ministry of Health handles the issue on the continuum of care. Uh, when I was working in Mbale, actually Mbale uh, had the highest maternal mortality ratio across the country. And uh, working with Spotlight Africa, we said, how can we be able to address uh, this issue. We started working on the issue of providing care um, and the established uh, that health center at Bukasasha and also working with the community leaders, training the midwives and also sensitizing the communities to see to it that we can make a contribution to the reduction of uh, maternal deaths. And uh, actually, the situation has been improving. Ambulance service is very key. Uh, looking at the three delays which contribute to maternal uh, mortality, we find that the second delay, that is the delay to reach care, can ever be addressed using the ambulance service. And the uh, uh, focus on ambulance service has a benefit of reaching the, the community and also the health facility. I do hope you found that interesting. It'd be great to hear from you if you have experience like these or if you have experience of working with the traditional birth attendants. Shared learning is what we'd really like to gain from this session. So do comment in that chat box. The next two talks are short talks about the challenge of getting data and the power of using that data. Uh, thank you very much. Keeping accurate uh, records is very essential and important for the health care system. Some of the challenges we have encountered in doing this uh, is the low level of literacy, of literacy for the clients who interact with in the community, as some of them have little or no education, and sometimes when you interview them and you are uh, getting information from them, they may not have good history, uh, their medical history, 
and sometimes our team that is collecting data need more time with them to obtain uh, the right data that we need from them. Secondly, also we have a challenge of IT issues where we, we experience we are experiencing transfers of staff, but also some of these staff are having poor typing skills and low IT skills, and we need more time with them to ensure that they master how to use the system. And also as we are trying to shift from the paperwork uh, to the electronic system. Currently, our team in the clinic, the health team as well as the sport night team, are working with the manual work, uh, the registers, as well as uh, the electronic system, and this is time consuming. And therefore, we need, uh, there's need for more time to prepare the team to switch from the manual work and then to the electronic system. The other challenge has also been uh, working on the timeliness of collecting data from the field. Most of our people we are working with are the community health promoters who are local volunteers from the community and they also have some other activities they are involved in, in the community. And this takes time to collect data from the community, but we are thankful for the current activities we are implementing especially under UKA, where we are trying to facilitate the CHPs to ensure that they collect data on a timely uh, basis from the community. Thank you very much. At Spotlight on Africa, we are instilling a culture of monitoring and learning. This is essential for our reporting to our donor, UK Aid, but also helps us to improve the accessibility of clinical services for expectant mothers and also highlights the impact of our outreach work in the community. I'd like to talk to you about the narrative that this information provides for us to understand what works well and also where the barriers remain. With this information, we can identify the more vulnerable marginalized women and mobilize our community health promoters to reach out to expectant mothers and their families. A key outcome indicator for us is to increase the number of antenatal clinics attended by expectant mothers. To this end, we are using a reporting tool that enables the clinical staff to log how many ANC appointments have been attended and when, so the community health promoters can contact patients who are overdue for their next clinic appointment. Since this program began in January, we have rapidly increased the number of women attending these clinics, more than tripling the number of women attending four or more antenatal clinics against our original baseline. Another key outcome indicator is for us to demonstrate that more women will give birth in a safe place. The safe place for our team is the clinic itself or a hospital. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the voluntary survey conducted at the clinic to identify trends in this decision making. Of the 120 informants, 111 intended to give birth at the clinic. That's over 90%. If we interrogate the data a little, we can identify really vulnerable patients. For those who have had home births previously, 70% was due to distance. Other factors included feeling safe at home and having a precipitated birth. But for those mothers who gave birth at home, 79% said it was not their choice. The births were attended by traditional birth attendants or their mother-in-law, but only one of these home births was attended by a midwife. Those who had home births also are more concerned for their current pregnancy. The good news is that now all of these women intend to give birth in the clinic, except one who will give birth in the hospital. Accessing maternal health care is clearly important as the data shows that those who give birth without a midwife also report to not immunize their babies. These are the most vulnerable in the community and through this work, we can identify them and put them in contact with their community health promoter to follow up and engage with the household decision makers about the importance of accessing these services. Against the baseline data for maternal deliveries, we are hitting our early milestone target of a 25% uplift in women recorded to give birth in the clinic. The target increases incrementally as the program progresses, 
And through the results of the survey about the intended location for the delivery, we are confident that those targets will also be met. In fact, we may need to beg the wonderful District Health Office for another midwife, should 90% of the women now look to the clinic as their preferred choice. Next, we are going to look at the impact of COVID-19, both on the community that we serve, but also on the impact of funding challenges to the charity sector. Richard Ocatel, our Executive Director in Uganda, is going to give us a flavour of this. This short talk is going to be followed by a two-minute video which has been produced by a professional photographer, Philip Lee Harvey. I want to bring to you the impact that we experience as a result of COVID-19. COVID-19 halted information sharing with the communities because of lockdown. There was no education in communities and health monitoring was also affected. Two, it broke down the more critical link of health to the community. The awareness and engagement on the causes, prevention, safe management of diseases was affected. Three, the general demand for medical health services at the community was affected. We could no longer have more people come to the health centers to seek for health services, the motivators of people, sending them to seek for this service was affected. Then there was this sudden, sudden isolation experienced by both the community and community health promoters. It brought a little bit of depression to our community health promoters. They were used to giving out messages to our communities. They enjoyed their work, but here there was sudden lockdown. The reaction, the energies that they had built was affected. On the general public, we experienced teenage pregnancies. There was food or food shortage or extreme hunger. Some families were eating once a day. Some were not even having a meal for two to three days, surviving on hot water. This was lost education. Our children who come from poor families could not afford online education, textbooks, newspapers, Zoom, all this, they didn't have this opportunity of, of helping themselves. You can aid funding has come at the right time. The community health promoters has been revived. The system has been revived. New CHPs have been enrolled and brought on board. New knowledge has been added, which is saving mothers and babies today in our communities. Records of pregnant mothers, records of babies, organizations are being kept. Regular visitations to the pregnant mothers for accidental care by our community promoters is now being done. Danger signs to pregnant mothers is being taught to them. Male participation is taking root. We can now see men participating in the heads of their wives, in the heads of their families. They carry even babies for immunization, the thing that they used not to do. Postnatal care at six days, six weeks, six months is not being done because new knowledge has come on board. Before, there was no one caring for the mothers. Today, we have a team of dedicated community health promoters for this purpose. 
community health promoters are like eyes and ears to the district health team. I thank you. My name is Ruth. I live in Uganda, and this is my story. I have been trained as a community health promoter. I go to my villages, I teach my people about health and the importance of fresh water. Spotlight on Africa gave us an ambulance. Before people would walk for many miles. If you're sick or pregnant, walking long distances is very dangerous. I can look after them on the journey to the clinic. They become my friends. My favorite thing is to sing in a local choir. Community house promoters have special songs they sing. We use songs to teach people. It gives me strength and power to know that I'm helping them. I want to be part of the change, not just for me, but also my community. Spotlight on Africa has helped us. I feel proud to be a community house promoter. I'm now independent and powerful. We now have a panel session to discuss strengthening health systems in Eastern Africa with a particular focus on PPP, Public-Private Partnership. Hevin Rees QC will be chairing the panel. He is a patron of Harfenden Spotlight in Africa and has previously been chair of the charity. He will be joined by Bim Afalami, MP, who is MP for Harfenden and Hitchin in the UK. And he is also a patron of Harfenden Spotlight on Africa. Also joining Hevin, will be Dr. Jonathan Wangizi, who is a district health officer in Mbali district, who has been instrumental in developing the PPP with Spotlight on Africa, and Richard Ocatel, our executive director in Uganda. Well, welcome to this uh, panel session today on the topic of strengthening health systems in Eastern Africa, and in this particular session, talking about Uganda. Uh, and how public-private partnerships can make a massive difference in delivering healthcare projects in places like Uganda. Uh, all four uh, speakers in this panel session have experience of PPP. Uh, we've all been involved in a PPP project in Eastern Uganda in the Mbali district, and we have built a level three health center. Um, and that in the first year of its uh, creation had over 50,000 patients. And so in an area where there was no level three health center there, it's obviously made a huge impact already. And we now have plans to build a new maternity center, which hopefully uh, we will start building in July uh, of this year. And so it's the benefits of PPP we want to uh, discuss uh, with you today. So before we look at our experience on the ground in Mbali, I thought, we might have a brief discussion on PPP generally in terms of why it's beneficial uh, to have PPP. Um, it's clear that the Ugandan government are very keen on PPP. They've uh, passed enabling legislation in 2015 uh, for the Public Partnership uh, Act. Uh, they've passed regulations in 2019 and guidelines, and they have their own dedicated PPP unit in the Ministry for Finance. And so there is a real calling by the Ugandan government for more partners in PPP. Uh, and the legislation is all there 
And the PPP unit is obviously a very well run unit with considerable expertise in Kampala. Now the usual model uh, is the design, build, finance, operate model. So the design, build and finance is usually done by the private sector, or in this case, charity sector. And then the operate is done by the uh, government. There are other models available, obviously, under PPP, but that's the one that we've been running. So, I mean, that's the Ugandan experience. Just briefly, uh, Bim, tell us a little bit about what the UK experience of PPP is by way of a comparator. So the UK was really a, a world leader in establishing public-private partnership. It was established sort of in the early 90s, 1991, 1992, when the then John Major government um, started doing this. And it's important to understand why they work, like what, what the point of all of this is. Because you may say, well, if you're providing a, a service like health, then surely the government should just do everything. But actually, the public sector has certain strengths, the private sector has certain strengths. The private sector can mobilize capital quickly. It understands finance, usually more effectively, and it can operate um, at scale. The public sector often has the skill set. They can run things very well and they understand the public need for certain things and in the way in which it can be delivered. And so if you harness those two strengths together, that's the strength of PPP. There is a wide degree of expertise and understanding in the UK about how to work with the public sector to deliver a product for the people in any given area. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, the Ugandan experience we've had uh, has been a very successful one in Mbali. What do you say to that, Jonathan? Has, that, has it been a success for, from your perspective as DHO? Yes, thank you, Riz. Um, yeah, I agree. The government is aware that we can do it our own. We need to do it with the partners. And uh, like you rightly put it, we have even a unit, it's now in the electorate, a uh, department rather. We have a department with an assistant commissioner in charge of partnerships and PPP, uh, PPPH. Now, when you bring it down to Mbare as a, 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 an administrative unit, a local government, uh, we, 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 we have tried within our means to reach our people in the spirit of the universal health coverage, but we've not reached him all. Yes. But uh, actually we have like three entities where we don't have government or a, a serious private partner. So what we've done in Bali, our arrangement with the Spotlight on Africa has enabled us to reach a very critical ad, uh, administrative unit, a peri-urban area, very densely populated, but that had been devoid of a, a public service. Mm. And at that, they were coming over to the town and uh, either going to the regional referral, which is really a referral unit, yeah. and they were not getting attended to, or going to a private for profit facility. Where they so have in, in this case, Dr. Jonathan, it's I think important to emphasize, isn't it? So this is a free service that we're providing at our level three. So everything is free. And so the 50,000 or so patients who come to see that level three clinic get that exactly. for free. Um, yes. And with the new maternity center, also yes. that will be a free service. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. So what Spotlight on Africa does is we place the, the infrastructure in place and uh, you then operate the clinic. You run yeah. it, uh, but we, of course, as partners, continue to help as much as we can in yeah. making sure it's a success, but largely the running of the an operation of the clinic is entirely down to you and your team. Yeah. Are there other comparative models in Ambali district, or is this so far the first PPP that has been delivered? I think uh, we have tried two PPPs. Uh, the, the, the first one was in Lemanyuni, when World Vision, which is an international NGO, 
uh, constructed and supported uh, us to run that facility. The, the, the second being the, the Kasacha and the spotlight on Africa uh, arrangement. It is a little special because for it, it is, you need indeed uh, build and uh, you, 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 you've allowed us to operate, but alongside you support some level leadership, there's some oversight, because for us, we are in so many places. The spotlight arm is supporting because we have gaps in the leadership and where there are shortfalls, they are standing really to support, the, the, especially the community outreach programs. Yeah. Mm. I suppose in establishing any PPP, BIM, uh, one of the key things to establish is r risk definition, uh, yes. risk evaluation, uh, risk allocation between prospective partners. Um, and I suppose that's one of the key things in establishing any PPP is identifying risk and allocating where it lies for the operation of the uh, project. Would you agree? Uh, yes, that's obviously true, but it's, it's even more complicated than that because of course what you're trying to do is once you've understood where risk should lie, that means that affects the cost of the capital that will be provided. And so understanding that is a really key thing. And by way of an example, because often these things just sound like gobbledygook, you can actually give examples. Right? So if you've got a private company A and a health district B, and they're trying to build a hospital, if private company A takes all the risk of the ongoing cost of the hospital going forward, the amount it will cost that private company to provide that finance is different than if the public sector in the in Uganda or any other country is is going to manage all that ongoing difficulty now the difficulty or rather not a difficulty the difference when you're dealing with a charity a third sector as we're dealing with here is that by its very nature charities are not banks they're not bottomless pits of money if only they were Pepin, if only they were so from the third sector perspective, we have to be very careful that we do not take on risks that it wouldn't be fair for us to take on because it could all go wrong and we don't have a bottomless bit of money. So it makes sense in the event we've got third sector and the government, maybe the government to take a bit more risk than you would with a typical private organization. And of course the government quite rightly very understandably, we maybe want more control. It may want more uh, control over how things were going to work and, and things into the future. And these are all subjects of negotiation, but I think that is the core of this issue, particularly when you're dealing with the third sector charities. Yes, thank you. Let's move on to talk about the future. Um, we've got a very exciting uh, maternity centre planned. Um, we are currently fundraising for it. We are halfway there, I'm pleased to say. Um, not yet the way there, <laughs> but for halfway there. And so we're hoping to start constructing in July this year. Um, now, we had a wonderful groundbreaking ceremony uh, for the Maternity Centre, which all four of us were there um, in September 2019, all pre-COVID. Um, Bim, just tell us a little bit about what your recollection of that day was when we had the Minister for State for Health of Uganda, uh, the Honourable Sarah Pendi, who came all the way from Kampala in order to officiate as the guest of honour at that groundbreaking ceremony. It is really a testament to the quality of the other panellists here and their commitment and their vision and their ability that the Minister of Health for Uganda came she saw the value and the capability that was in Mbali and with Harbin and Spotlight for Africa in Uganda. And I think it's really, really important that everybody understands that. Uh, it was really exciting. She was very interested in the project. She taught around everything. She spoke to everybody. She was really interesting. And the thing she said to me um, amongst sort of 
uh, various other things was, you know, I want to see if we can do more of these in other parts of Uganda. Mm. And that shows just how effectively this has been managed and the partnership that we've created. So look, it was a very exciting thing, lots of fun. It did, it was quite long, if I remember <laughs> rightly. It was quite long. They always, it, they always are. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it was quite long, um, but the dancing was fantastic. Community support <laughs> was fantastic. I've been to many events in different places before, <laughs> but I have not yet been to an event before or since with the level of warmth commitment, understanding, and, and real strength of purpose that this, uh, that this has. Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, the people on the ground are absolutely the ones who deliver uh, these projects. Um, and this paternity centre is a, it's going to be quite a big centre. Um, we're trying to make it so that we deliver a thousand babies safely every year. So in conclusion, um, Dr. Jonathan, um, thinking back four years when we first opened the Level, level 3 Health Centre. So actually, if you really think back, it's four years ago when we were I, discussing the idea of a PPP. Um, for those who are listening um, to this session, what are your concluding remarks in terms of PPP? Would you recommend it to other DHOs? For us... It is working, working very well. So we've averted so many uh, deaths, maternal deaths, and we've improved it a lot in terms of community health services through our partnership, encourage it. What's your response, uh, Richard, in terms of the success, in your view, from the charity's perspective of this PPP? If I can bring it out, from the challenge point of view. PPP is still a new concept in Uganda. So there's a lot of learning, learning, learning taking place. So you must be willing to learn. The people working with you must be willing to learn. It is this learning approach that has helped us to move for the last 10 years. Thank you very much, Richard. So, I mean, Bim, uh, final words from you. The test I use is, would I be happy for my child to be born in this center? Mm -hmm. uh, and my answer to you is very simple. The answer is yes. Mm. That's the best endorsement I can give. Yes, thank you very much. Great, well, thank you very much, everyone. Now we are going to hear from three speakers who are going to talk powerfully about the role of IT in transforming healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa. First of all, we'll be joined by Dr. Peter Smith from EMR4DW, which stands for Electronic Medical Records for the Developing World. It's a software package that he helped to develop, and it's a package that we use in our clinic. Then we are privileged to be joined by Lord Anthony Sinjin of Bledsoe, who will be giving an interesting insight into healthcare technology development. And finally, we will be joined by Professor Peter Oliput Oliput, who is a professor of clinical and infectious epidemiology, who will bring this to life as he talks about using IT in practice. Thank you, Peter and Bas, for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to start with the first question. What inspired you to start EMR 4DW and what are the challenges of digital record keeping? Well, thank you, Bethan. That's a very interesting first question. Um, well, after 25 years working with um, digital records in the UK primary care system and helping to develop it indeed, um, I took electricity electronic chronological medical records and disease coding and counting for granted. And when I began work in Baduda uh, in Eastern Uganda, 
I found that none of these facilities were available in a clinic seeing 100 patients a day. And in fact, really the need for such a system was far more great and would have had a much bigger impact on health and well-being than anywhere I'd worked in the past. So yeah, basically, if, if you can code diseases and look at live disease prevalence, both in numbers and location, surely we can make a difference. Um, so, and, and you know, I felt the lack of internet and regular electricity needn't be a barrier. Uh, and I think we've shown this with our system. Um, we've now provided digital records across the globe, um, all developed from the original concept of the comprehensive Uganda NHMS uh, reporting requirements. So we have 10 active clinics across Uganda, uh, with the largest in Bushika uh, having 55,000 patients on the database. Uh, and really the most common feedback we receive is, how did we manage before your AMRs came? So that's enough for me and us to carry on. Thank you. Um, I, I, I head up the, uh, the charity's um, technical team. Uh, we've been very lucky in that the, the system has been led from the front by, by UK GPs who've actually been to Uganda and had feet on the ground. Uh, if we were developing such a system for for the UK, we would have been we would have done it in a completely different way. As it is, we had an insight from Peter and his colleagues who've actually been to U Uganda, and we have an understanding of the extreme challenges faced. So, from a technical spec perspective, what we have been uh, driven to do is to keep everything as simple as possible. Um, make the system simple to uh, install make the simple simple make the system simple to learn uh, and also make the system simple to maintain we remove as much of the technical overhead as we possibly can we also endeavor to make the system uh, as flexible as possible and in that way we have versions of the system for clinics with or without an internet connection and we allow the medical record system to be loaded onto a laptop so that it can operate out with uh, a connection from the main clinic so that outreach work can be undertaken. Uh, we also um, communicate the data to ministries of health if clinics uh, choose to do that using DHIS2. Um, and so what our system ultimately allows clinicians to do and clinics to do is to uh, undertake consultations at the bedside of a patient out with an internet connection and for that data to be aggregated and to be reported back to the Ministry of Health in as long as it takes the clinician to get to an internet connection. That's great, thank you. Um, so what is the impact on maternal health care do you think? You know, we know that poor antenatal attendance is a major contributing factor to high rates of maternal mortality. If we can identify hard to reach groups by searching and listing non-attenders, you know, we can look at geographical prevalence, we can look at where they're from, uh, we, we can help, you know, as part of the team, change healthcare seeking behaviour and getting community workers where they're needed. We found, you know, using um, HMS reporting, that um, exchanges of ideas and skills around data become commonplace in the team. And you know, if problems do uh, occur, then significant events can be easily discussed because everybody's got easy access to the data. And really this is an essential tool in clinical care. It's a sort of learning by, by osmosis, by, by daily exposure to problems rather than attending monthly lectures. And if everybody's got access to this data, if there is a problem, you can have an instant significant event and, 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 and people learn. And, 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 and as we know, all clinical care is about learning and training. So, you know, we feel a, a globally accessible system um, w w w continues to have an impact and could have further impact if we can develop it more in the maternal world. Hello, Anthony Lord St. John of Letso. You've been in the House of Lords for over 40 years now, but how did you personally become such an advocate of IT in Africa? Well, thank you very much and delighted to be participating in this uh, UK East Africa Virtual Health Summit 
uh, together with several of my colleagues in the House of Lords. Yes, I'm quite long in the tooth. I've been in the Lords since 1978, year before Margaret Thatcher came to power. Um, but um, I lived and was educated in South Africa. Um, I studied law there. Uh, but since joining the House of Lords, uh, I've had a, a strong interest in being an ardent campaigner on gender equality, social and economic upliftment, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm currently one of the vice chairman of the uh, all-party parliamentary Africa group and, and Zimbabwe group. So with the uh, dramatic uh, impact of digital transformation over the last 30 years and more recently the advances in smart technologies, I've become particularly passionate about a number of areas. Yes, and how important actually is IT for those poorest regions of Africa and how accessible is it? Well, of course, that's the key is to building inclusive digital economies in Africa. Uh, the digital agenda has formed the centerpiece of the global development agenda to address the cycle of increased deprivation and the lack of education in the poorest regions of Africa, particularly in the rural communities, a lot of that being the focus of where Harpenter Spotlight Africa is looking. Five years ago, the World Bank issued a development report called the Digital Dividends, which really looked beyond connectivity to government services, efficiency and productivity gains, and using IT to enhance access to better education. But at a time when Africa has over a billion people, um, many of whom are living in deprived communities, um, really the mobile phone industry uh, can potentially unlock huge dividends for those who are living in extreme poverty. And it's well known uh, that healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa uh, remains the worst in the world. Uh, with few countries able to spend more than, I think the, the World Health Organization really looked at $34 to $40 per person um, as the minimum in basic health. And this hasn't happened. So as African economies improve and with advances in AI analytics, uh, there is an increased opportunity here for health tech to play a major role for those poorer communities. There's been a digital global IT revolution. And in a strange way, Africa has leapfrogged many of the developed countries who've got legacy IT systems. They paid fortunes for Microsoft and SAP. But for many of the African countries where they don't have these legacy systems, they've actually, with the advances in IT and analytics and um, you know, machine learning, they've leapfrogged. Very exciting. And what is your experience of a transforming effect that IT has on medicine in particular in Africa? Well, I'd like to prefix that by saying that I'm particularly impressed by the amazing work of Harpenton Spotlight Africa. You know, I think the charity has done a huge amount to promote education, uh, innovative teaching, and to help deprived communities move out of the cycle of poverty and discover new horizons. So uh, I'm just giving a little bit of a thumbs up to Harvard to spot like that, because I do think that you and, and have, you've done a huge amount of help. And it's, it's not just been a matter of a hand out, it's been a hand up. So, so really well done. But you asked the question, about how IT is transforming medicine in Africa. Uh, I'm the chairman of uh, one of the largest hematology blood testing laboratories in Africa. Uh, we've done up to 15 million blood tests uh, on an annualized basis. We're predominantly in Egypt. We've just expanded into Nigeria. We've had a long-standing presence in Sudan, and we're targeting several other sub-Saharan Africans countries. Your blood testing is key to getting the data which you need to better assist. And, and, and there's quite a lot to be said about this. Using big data and artificial intelligent analytics, 
This has enabled telemedicine, giving particularly patients in rural communities the opportunity to get expert medical advice. But through the wonders of IT, and through the wonders of medtech, and through the wonders of telemedicine, potentially hundreds of thousands of lives can be saved who are previously dependent on doctors with the assistance of IT and health tech. That said, there is a negative, and the negative is access to affordable broadband. In this regard, innovators like Elon Musk, the Gates Foundation, Jeff Bezos, and others, I believe are playing a, a very important role, and I'm working quite closely with them on providing affordable satellite technologies to provide access to uh, broadband in many of the poorer countries in Africa. This is key. Health tech will not work unless you have access to the internet, access to broadband. We've seen the huge improvements in health care in India with the access to affordable broadband. And this now has got to be one of the challenges for Africa. It isn't just a dream, it can be a reality. I would just finally, finally say, I think one of the, the issues which should be discussed at this conference, and one of the challenges, is going to be promoting a digital identity for every person in Africa. If you can create a digital identity and a digital footprint and a digital DNA of every person in Africa, you'll go a long way to solving this major crisis. Thank you very much indeed. We really appreciate a valuable contribution. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share on digital health for enhanced specialized care across boundaries and remote areas in developing countries. My name is Professor Peter Olpot Olpot. I work with Mbale Clinical Research Institute and Busitama University in Eastern Uganda. The challenges in the health systems in developing countries can broadly be div divided into three categories, including access issues, partial functionality, and resources. Innovations such as digital health have a very high potential of improving health coverage, share available resources, improve patient outcomes, and advance networking between parties. I would like to share with you three projects that we have been involved in that demonstrate the role of digital health in enhancing patient care services in developing countries. At Mbale Regional Referral Hospital, we looked at the causes of delay among pregnant mothers that were responsible for poor outcomes. We looked at issues related to delays within our hospital and we found those contributed to 25% of all delays. But the other 75% were outside our setting. And so we started a project that addressed directly these delays outside, but also had implications on improvement of delays within. So we looked at transport, healthcare related issues, health center and transport issues and patient factors. In most of the health facilities that surround Mbali and serve Mbali, there is an ambulance system which is operational. So we needed digital health as a value addition to improve uh, outcomes as a result of delays. So what did we intend to solve? Our aim was set to improve efficiency of a referral system and thereby reduce delays that are associated with poor outcomes among pregnant mothers. So we started a project called Digital Emergency Referral System as an innovation, which was catalyzed by ICT. And this networked Mbale Regional Referral Hospital to all other referring sites in the region. Briefly, a patient goes to the health facility from her home or her community. And when she reaches there, she expects to deliver. In the process, some complications might come in. Either these are complications that have come with the patient or the complications are as a result of delays within the first contact of the health system, which is normally the primary health facility. At that point, the health center has to make a decision of referral. And so this system links 
that facility, the ambulance driver, our facility, and the specialists who are going to work on such a patient. And through this system, we're able to improve outcomes of patients and reduce delays. The other project that I would like to demonstrate is the one on HIV care. In the early days of HIV care, the resource limited facilities, including ours, had the physicians, but we did not have all the knowledge that is required to care for patients, including use of the advanced medications. So what we did, we networked with a facility in the UK and another facility in Ethiopia. And this system worked on uh, text messages as well as emails. So whenever we could receive a patient, we could consult our colleagues in the UK and within the real time, we get the advice that was required to help the patient. And in the end, we're able to gain education from the experts, the patients were able to get the appropriate medication with good outcomes, and the facilities were able to take on additional burden of patients without need for additional specialists since we had uh, specialists from the UK working with us. The third one is mobile medicine for mobile health. This one is an education tool that empowers mothers in the community. We targeted mothers who are HIV positive, and all that we did was to develop a system which is having an international toll-free gateway. And on that toll-free gateway, we made a decision tree where a patient can directly contact the system or a system would generate an automated message. And through a decision tree, patients would be empowered to take on a decision that is safe for them, safe for the baby and good for a health facility. The beneficiaries of all this digital health that I've talked about are patients, health institutions, training institutions, telecom companies, and researchers. Thank you for listening to me. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucien Wansinja, who is doing some transformational work with the Fistula Foundation. And after this short talk, we will have some time for Q&A and whatever we cannot cover in that session, we will pick up on the chat box. I'm Dr. Lucien Wasinga Kasereka. I'm a fistula surgeon, a trainee from, from FICO, and I'm the director and the founder of the FISPRO, Fistula Program DRC. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Lucien Wasinga Kasereka the director and founder of the Fistula program DRC, FISPRO. Today I'm going to talk about the women refugee population who need the response in Uganda and DRC Congo. As you know, the DRC Congo is in Africa and it is the second largest country in Africa with over 8 million people. And for us, we are working in the eastern part of Congo, in the province of North Kiv, where the violence and the war have been permanent for over 20 years now, so that we are bordering with Uganda. And the bad effects of the war, according to the OCHA report, which was presented in February, more than 4,100 uh, people moved from their homes in Beni town in the North Kivu, just close to Uganda. And the majority of the, this population, they were women. And in March, in all the province, uh, more than 2 million people uh, were displaced internally into the country from their homes. And some of them, they crossed the border up to Uganda and became refugees. They really need our support because most of them they are suffering and uh, they need a special protection and help because this political instability has completely deteriorated the maternal health in this region. And the numbers of uh, childbirth injuries like vesicovaginal fistula rectovaginal fistula and other uh, gynecology problems, the numbers have increased 
uh, due to the violence and uh, the lack of uh, the maternal health. Even the maternal mortality has increased also significantly. And recently we got some support from uh, the Tisula Foundation and the FICO to rescue many women who have been suffering for several years. According to the WHO, more than 2 million of women are living with obstetric fistula in the world, and we are getting uh, 50,000 to 100,000 new cases every year. And in DRC, 5,000 5, and 10,000, up to 10,000 are living with fistula due to lack of treatment and factors are many, the war, lack of the skilled doctors, lack of health facilities, and so on. So that, that is how we created our own charity, a fistula program, DRC FISPRO, to try to rescue the women and uh, to restore their dignity. Our mission is to restore the dignity by doing free obstetric fistula operations and uh, to give a free transport, free meals, and uh, we always give a dignity package to all the women we always treat. And uh, apart from that, we always organize a reintegration program. We give uh, economical support to those women after the surgery so that the medical care is free of charge. And the surgical operations are done free of charge in a, a nice way because we have to check on the safety of the patient. And we do a regular post-operative care uh, by, with our teams. So that we always train uh, nurses, midwives, and uh, doctors to try to prevent the burden in the region. Apart from training, we always go to the community, we always organize outreaches to try to explain to the population the, the, about the obstetric fistula, because most of them, they always think that uh, the fistula is a punishment from God or someone who didn't respect some cultural rules and is punished by God. And that is the way they don't even bother to go for treatment. So that for us, we always bring back hope and joy because after suffering for many years, when they come to us, we always treat them free of charge and we give them economical support. They go back with hope and joy to live. So that we always offer a psycho socio-economical support and we help them how to make small economies and we teach them small, small work and uh, waving basket and uh, so that they can sell them after treatment and they can make, they can be independent and so that they can get money from small businesses. In Uganda, We've been doing fistula surgery since 2003. Myself, Dr. Mora Lynch, and visiting surgeons from uh, abroad, we've done more than 7,000 operations free of charge. Uh, we note that Dr. Mora is the pioneer of uh, fistula surgery in Uganda. So that we really bring back the smile and happiness. And we are transforming lives of many women now. And our determination, we, we, didn't, we did not wait for the four, four by four wheels car to restore their dignity, but we are using available means of transport so that we can go to the villages and get these women to be treated. So that we are enjoying helping others about uh, we are, uh, and what, what about you now? Let us re restore the women's dignity together. We should work as a team so that we can change their lives. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Accent Sana.